no bullshit on this one. I don't think the best business person and the best marketer are necessarily the 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 the, the, the book smart people. Stéphane Birubé, former chief marketing officer at L'Oréal Canada and Western Europe. How, how do you know if someone will become a vice president or a general manager or a marketing director or so on and so forth? Uh, for me, the, the, the number one thing is, is, is self-confidence. Uh, in order to continue growing every day, we always need to be better and challenge ourselves. I think there's also the inspirational leader who will make you believe there is an island. President of L'Oréal Canada CPD division. And I'm wondering if you could Pull it down to three points. What's a good feedback? First one is, and second one I would say, and the third one is. Before we let the stories of the past shape your future, it would mean the world to me if you could follow us or subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to us. Enjoy the conversation. So, without any further ado, Brandon, let the stories of the past shape your future on the Quoting Life Podcast. Often, we're in business school, when we look at executives, we almost put them on a pedestal, right? We, we don't necessarily understand the story behind them or how they got to the position they are in today. And so I wanted to ask you, what are the things I need to understand about your childhood to understand the person that's sitting in front of me today? It's a good question. But the first thing, uh, first for inviting me, uh, for, thank you. Listen, uh, it's funny because every generation, I guess, have the same questions because I'm sure uh, 26, 27 years ago, I had exactly the, the same question um, than uh, the year I goes, but the questions uh, are still the same. I, I hope the answers are evolving. <laughs> um, no, listen, I mean, um, one thing that I know is that, and I'll speak about myself, um, and I'll speak a bit about my experience, but the end of the day, I think self-confidence is probably the, the, the your best friend and your best asset. You know, we we all go to the same university. Uh, we're all smart. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, what makes the difference between becoming a president, a vice president, director, or so on and so forth? I truly believe is it has a lot to do with self-confidence. Um, I think uh, trusting yourself, trust, trusting your instinct, taking risks, taking chances. Um, I think makes a huge difference. And uh, also, I mean, for me, is the basic of being a great leader. And uh, often people ask me, what's the difference? Like, uh, how do you know if someone will become a vice president or a general manager or a marketing director or so on and so forth? And again, everyone's smart. Everyone went to the same universities. What makes the difference is the soft skills. And uh, for me, the, the, the number one thing is, is, is self-confidence. And this is something that I guess I, I got from my, yeah, my, from my parents uh, at a young age. And, you know, every time you, you go through a tough times during your career, during your life, you're, you, you have to sit a positive way to build your self-confidence. Uh, I think that would be my, my, my advice. It's true that going to tough, tough times sometimes might be very difficult, but um, I think you have to see the positive side of it and see how you can learn from it and build your self-confidence, which will, I think, be with you for the rest of your career. Touching up a little more on leadership, I recently wrote a paper for my HR class on laissez-faire leadership. And I know you've, uh, you're you in charge of an entire division and you've been in charge of a great deal of people. What kind of leadership style do you find yourself taking? That's a very good question. And you know what? It's often a question I ask people. And it's funny because... Hmm. A lot of young people, you ask the question around 23, 25, or anyways, below 30, and they usually don't know. They, they, they make up a story, but you, you truly see that they don't know which kind of leader they are, and it's normal. And I think you, you learn uh, being a leader as, as you go. And again, uh, personally, my, my leadership style, and I'm going to say it and I, with, um, I hope, humility, but I think there's different kind of leader. Leaders that lead by example. Uh, there is leader that are so just smarter, have an amazing vision. You know, those people that they look at the sea, they know there is an island, even though no one sees it. You know, that's the kind of visionary leader. And there's a kind of leader that will 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 just go and start swimming, and people will follow, which are the the one leading by example. 
And I think there's also the inspirational leader who will make you believe there is an island, you know. And 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 I think I'm more a, an inspirational leader. Um, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the one with the most amazing vision. Um, I, I think sometimes people need to tell me there is an island. But I think I'm good to make my team believe there is an island. Uh, and I think that's my kind of leadership. Um, and, and, and yeah, this is part of my personality and, and a lot of people are telling me that one of the reasons they follow me is because they feel I'm transparent. I say the truth and, uh, I'm trustable. Then that's why I think it's, it's part of the, it's more my personality than my vision or leading by example in my case anyways. Is that something you've had early on or is that something that it took you time to discover that you're able to make people see that there's an island? It, 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 it's funny because sometime when you, you, you're young in your career or even at work, I mean, or even hockey, hockey team or football team or whatever sports team, sometimes you see your leadership at X, Y, Z, and then you see other leader and you're trying to be another leader, right? You're working on X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a recipe for success. Um, I, mm. I, I think great leader they need to focus on their strength uh, and push their strength to to the max. You know, then you know in my case, even if I would like to be perceived as a genius, I'm no one. I, I I know I'm not. Even if I want to be perceived as someone with an amazing vision, I know I'm not. You know, uh, then at the end of the day, I know what I am. And to answer your question, and this is what I focus on, this is what I'm pushing to the max, versus trying to improve what I will probably never be. Because you have the choice. Eh? You can learn on your weakness and try to improve, or you can push on your strength and just be the best at something. I personally believe you're best at pushing your strength to the full, to the max, and, and take advantage of it. Doesn't mean that you cannot improve everything else. I'm just talking about leadership, for example, for me. I think at a young age, I realized that I could have an impact on people. Um, and, 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 and I figured out that sometimes I have, I'm surrounded with people with better ideas than me, better vision than me, but I, 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 I realized that I was maybe better in getting people to believe in their vision or, 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 or to follow their vision. Um, and, and this is what I've started focusing on and truly I, I realized my leadership style probably around, I started managing people and teams maybe around, I don't know, 25, 26, 26 years old. Uh, I'm uh, no, 49 now. I think I, I, I discovered my real leadership style probably around 35 years old. I, I mean, it takes time, eh? because at the end, it goes by uh, trial and mistake. And sometimes, you know, you try things and... and and you get the feedback. I think to become a great leader today, you need to be humble. I think regardless of your leadership style, you need to be humble. You need to listen to feedback. You need to be able to receive more feedback than giving feedback. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and when you do that, I think it's it's something that you uh, you work on yourself. But it's a conquest. Eh? I'm 49 years old. Am I a better leader than I was at uh, 40 or at 30? I hope so. But I hope I'm also uh, going to be a, even a better leader in five, six, seven years from now. You know, it's I think even though I'm more on the end of my career than the beginning, I I, I still think there's ways to improve. And uh, in all confidence, uh, you know, I have a coach. I took a coach at 47 years old. First time of my life, really? I have a coach, uh, a professional coach. Huh. And the reason why is I, I, I thought I was a good leader, but maybe not as modern as I was hoping. And uh, mm. yeah, I decided at 47 years old that I would work on my, my on being even a, a more modern leader, you know, and, and I'm working on it. Is it going to work? I don't know, you know? but, uh, you know, more inclusive, uh, maybe more patient, uh, you know, uh, listening a little bit more to than. I, I always think you can improve, but again, I'm back to my point: is is you got to work on, on your strengths and, and push your strength to the to to uh, to the best. 
you touched there on feedback and something I've been hearing about you is that you give quite good feedback yourself. And I'm wondering if you could bullet down to three points, what's a good feedback? What would those three bullet points be? Well, the first, the first of all I want to do is I'll tell you exactly the three points. But the first thing I want to say is uh, feedback is, is first of all, both ways all the time. Second, it's also uh, 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 either positive or constructive. Okay. Uh, and it's true that sometimes when you ask, uh, you say, uh, can I give you feedback? Person will always think, oh, what do I need to improve? Or, you know, so sometimes feedback is very positive too, right? I think the three things to uh, the art, let's call it the art of giving feedback. First one is um, you have to make sure the person that you will give feedback is ready to listen and is in the winning condition. Um, if you try to give the feedback to someone when the person is pissed off, when the person is having a tough day, when the person is tired, when the person you're not, the person is not in the winning condition to receive the feedback. And the first thing I would say, always make sure that the person you're giving the feedback to is in the, their winning condition and always ask permission to give feedback. The second one I would say is that never give feedback in a way that it would be ju judgment, a judgment. Okay. Um, I, I truly believe that every individual know themselves more than me. Right? Even if I have a, a director I need to give feedback to, even if it's tough and constructive, I truly believe that inside the person knows. Do they see it? Do they admit it? Do they, I mean, there's all sign. But then the second bullet I would say is instead of giving feedback straight with judgment is ask questions. And, and often the person's going to give you, they're going to get out the feedback you want to give them. They're going to see it their way and then you just have to spin it and spin it and say you know what is exactly what i'm talking about here i want to give you this example and the third one is i i think you got to be honest it's 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 very difficult sometimes to be honest and transparent um i have people crying sometimes uh, when you give them feedback <laughs> but then they call you or they tell you a week later thank you staff you know what? No one I've never mm. shared that with me. Well, no one never told me X or Y or Z. And usually people appreciate it. But again, it needs to be done a certain way. Then my three bullets would make sure the person receiving feedback is in agreement to receive feedback and second is in their winning condition. The second one is ask questions because the person usually know themselves more than you and they will they will they will give you the answer and then you just have to spin it back. And the third one is be transparent and be courageous um, because long term, it always pay out for the person you give the feedback to and it always pay out for, for yourself as a manager. Nowadays, when you look at most LinkedIn profiles, notice that people tend to jump from position to position. But I know you've worked with L'Oreal pretty much your entire career. Like, What about it um, attracts you to the workplace? I know you work from an entry level position all the way up to the position you're in today? No, it's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> just for everyone, I, I've done uh, five years at Procter & Gamble, and then I moved to L'Oreal in uh, 2002, which means, yes, uh, 21 years at L'Oreal. You know what? I mean, I, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, are you going to stay 20 years at L'Oreal? Then the odds would have said no. And when I joined L'Oreal, to be honest with you, I was joining L'Oreal potentially for three to five years. You know, I was uh, hoping to get wow. a certain level, a certain position, and then continue to evolve in different companies and so on and so forth. Um, I didn't like necessarily when I joined L'Oreal, the first one in the first two years, didn't like it. Um, feel awkward a bit to work for a French company when I was working at the Procter & Gamble, an American company, very different. But at the end of the day, you know, um, what makes me stay at L'Oreal is that I, uh, for me, what's important is that I need, I need to have the freedom. Um, if you put me in the box, I'm not happy. I need the freedom. Uh, I like to be an entrepreneur. And I think L'Oreal, this is what L'Oreal is giving me, is has always given, given me the opportunity to be an, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, which means being an, an entrepreneur, but inside a big company. And uh, I always see myself as managing my own business. 
but with a guaranteed paycheck at the end of the month, which, I mean, it's, uh, it's the way I see it. Then Loyal is giving me the freedom I need. The Loyal is, is really uh, valuing my entrepreneurial spirit. And one thing also that is important is when, when, when you look for a company, and again, we all go to the same university, we all roughly have the same average, and then, you know, we're all smart, but uh, what makes a difference between someone successfully being successful in a company or another is sometimes the fit with the company. And um, I have to admit that, yes, it's true that I've been successful at L'Oreal, but it doesn't mean I would have been successful in uh, every other company. You know? And I think the reason why I stayed at L'Oreal 21 years, and I think I hope to stay another eight months until retirement, um, it's uh, it's exactly by that I think my set of values are very similar to L'Oreal. You know, we value courage, uh, we value a transparency, uh, we value entrepreneurship, and it's all some it's all my values that before the talent, before the the the, the, the competencies, before the skill sets. What's the most important thing when you choose a company and when you decide to sit in the company is the value of the company needs to match your company, your value. Because otherwise, you ne will never, you're never going to give you 100%. Because if you don't believe in the values, the purpose, the values of the company. And for me, I'm super proud still today to work at L'Oreal. I look at the values of L'Oreal. I look at the purpose of L'Oreal and a sense of purpose. And I'm, I'm, I'm super proud. L'Oreal is one of the most ethical companies. Uh, L'Oreal is uh, has an amazing uh, focus on saving the planet. From uh, we have a big program called L'Oreal for the Future. L'Oreal is uh, reinvesting a lot in uh, social causes. Uh, anyways, I can go on and on, but at the end of the day, I don't work for for L'Oreal because it's a healthy financial company, or I'm not working for L'Oreal because I'm passionate of lipstick. It's just, it's, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm passionate of the industry of beauty because it's a fast-moving industry. It's a very complex industry. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, 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 a growing a growing industry. It's an industry driven by innovation. It's also uh, mm. an industry driven by marketing, which I love. This is at the root what I'm doing today. I'm more of a business person, managing operation, HR, finance, marketing, and sales, but I still started my career in marketing. Then these these are the reasons why I'm still at L'Oreal, but at first, again, it's, it's really the value of the company, which match mine. And when you have a match on values, everything else is just give your best. And, and technically, if you have a bit of talent, you, you should succeed. You've been the CMO of Western Europe at L'Oreal, also in Canada. And L'Oreal has one of the is one of the biggest marketing companies in the world. I mean, wherever you go, you'll most likely see a L'Oreal ad. What's the key to success for a good marketing campaign at L'Oreal? It's a very good point, question because it, 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 it actually, it's a good, but it's a complex question because there's no straight answer. Um, why is, and I, I know it's gonna sound boring, but at the end of the day, it depends on your objective, you know, and, and, and you can try mm -hmm. Two, two very similar campaign mechanical uh, mechanics use the same the same campaign the same approach to two different things and it's gonna one's gonna succeed the other one's gonna fail you know because it's not gonna be uh, maybe uh, addressing the right target maybe it's gonna be not in the right tone maybe it's not you know and there's also in today's world as you know more than me it's super complex because you know we you have all the well, the TikTok of this world, uh, the gaming platforms, <laughs> yeah. the, the Facebook, the, well, so on and so forth, the Amazon media, which at the end is, is still still media. Uh, but you also have the component of the, the, the creative. And you can choose the best. You, you know as much as I, I, I can. I can put millions on TikTok. But if I don't have the right creative, it's going to be useless, as you know. And uh, then... I know I'm not trying to avoid the question. I, I just think that the best campaigns are the one that starts with very, very, very sharp objectives. And that you hmm. clearly know at the beginning what success looks like or not. And the best campaign after are the one that um, you, um, you optimize in real time. 
the days are finished of uh, putting a, a marketing plan together, a campaign together, and then you close your eyes for the next eight months and you, you hope for the best. Uh, the, this was like this when I started working 25 years ago. But now it's not the case. I think the best campaign, again, to summarize my answer, or the one that have clear objective, clear KPI. The second is the one that you optimize in real time uh, and modify both the, the media, both the, the, the creative, etc. And, and, and the third one is, I would say, is the best campaign or usually the one that will drive the brand over time and not necessarily drive sales overnight. And um, sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that uh, to do a short-term coup of selling things overnight, it's great. But I believe you drive you drive brands over time and not overnight. You drive sales overnight, but you drive brands over time. Then the best campaign for me are the one that build your brand and not just drive sales overnight. Hmm. Yeah. So. In business school, uh, one thing I've noticed I'm doing a lot of is cases, done a lot of case competitions. And right now, for one of my classes, I'm doing a case. And we use like tools like the Gantt chart and uh, SWOT analysis and BMC and tools like that. Do you ever see that in like your profession? <laughs> or is that something like just is in university for courses. Basically, is what is what we're learning useless or is no, it useless? I'll tell you the truth. No bullshit on this one. I don't think the best business person or the best marketer are necessarily the the, 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 the book smart people. Um, hmm. I mean uh, we have higher people with the best the best grades at university, but they don't necessarily are always the best in uh, in, in the job on the job. And vice versa. But at the end of the day, I, I've been thinking a lot. And, and one of the questions I get a lot sometimes is even from my own employees, staff, should I go back for an MBA? Should I go back for a master? Do you put any value into it? What do you think? And, and, and for me, it, it, this is it, you know, it's like, it's not because you have a driving lesson and you have a driver license that you're a good driver. And it's not because you're a good driver <laughs> yeah. that you're gonna make, you're gonna win races, you know. Then mm. at the end of the day, the driving less license gives you the right to drive a car. After, uh, are you gonna be a good driver or not? It's a it's one thing. Then if you're a good driver, good for you. Uh, then you might get promoted and so on and so forth. But you're still not a race car, a racing car uh, driver, you know. Then, if you want to become the best in your job, then you need to become a a, a, a racer, a, a driver. Right? Then it's the same. It's the same license. Right? One uh, then, but again, it's just give you the, the 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 basic things to drive the car. At the end, if it's up to you what you decide to do. If you decide to continue to drive your drive your, your car safely, good for you. You're gonna have an amazing career, but you might never get promoted, and you never get that. It's good for you. I mean, you're happy. Um, but if you want to win championship, if you want to make sure you're the best, I mean, you're going to have to, to practice, you're going to have to work hard, you're going to, you know, then I think the, what you learn at school is a good base for reflection. And I think what I appreciate from school is it gives, uh, us because I went to school to university, it gives us a frame of work, a frame of thinking, a methodology of thinking. And those that are usually book smart and good at university will have a better methodology, a better approach to issues, mm. a better reflection. Uh, they will mo sometimes be better at thinking of solutions because they will approach a certain way and they will usually be better in analysis. But at the, at the end, do they teach you at university to be creative? Do they teach you at university to think out of the box? Do they teach you how to use your instinct? Do they teach you how to take risk? Do they, not at all. They don't teach any of them. Do they teach you how to do a great campaign on Instagram or on TikTok or on Twitch? No, no. no. And again, see for me what's important at school. And it's funny, I have my kids now 18, 16, 14, and one of my boys asked me almost the same question and says, Dad, uh, why to go to university? And 
I can run a company and you can help me and you tell me how to do it and this and that. But you know, the three years of or four year four years of university. I'm, my point always is not about the the, the learning what a sweat analysis is. It's more t learning how to approach a problem and mm. identifying the strength, the weaknesses, the opportunities, etc. For me, is a thinking methodology. Then that's why at L'Oréal we hire. I have someone right now, a young fellow from UK that I brought from the UK. Uh, he's an expat. He's thirty years old. His name is Alfie. The guy study his story. Okay, he's uh, English mm. in French, uh, literature anglaise, English. Uh, yeah, literature. But the guy is uh, data driven, like you cannot imagine. He understands the TML. He work. He leads Amazon for us. Uh, you can think the guy oh. is an actuary or the guy study finance because he's data driven. You understand the TML. He, he study history. Then again, Alf is a good example where I don't care if, and this is, I think, the big mistake sometimes people that they're good in marketing because they have a master in marketing. Uh, this honestly, I'm sorry to say, uh, this is bullshit. This is useless. Study whatever you want. You want to study to be an engineer, study it to be an engineer, you might end up being a good marketer. You want, you know, you're passionate about, about a story and study a story, and then you, you, you can work in marketing. I mean, marketing and sales. You don't learn any competencies that will be useful in your job. You learn methodology of thinking, but this you can learn doing any 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 program at school at university. Then, long story short, is get a university degree. Whatever you study, lawyer, accounting, marketing, history, uh, whatever, because it's going to give you a methodology of thinking. And this you be will be be able to apply in your marketing job. And then we're gonna teach you how to use your instinct. We're gonna push you out to use your creativity. We're gonna you push you to take risk and whatever you study. If you have a great methodology and you use your creativity, you, your instinct, you will be a great marketer. As you would say, since school teaches you about the methodology, is it important to do case comps? I know you're a huge yeah. advocate for brainstorm. It's not a way for students to explore Absolutely. that creativity and develop Absolutely. that. Absolutely, and that's why I, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I love brainstorm. I've been a coaches and 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 and, and, and judge on, on brainstorm for for many times, many years. By the way, I also did business uh, games when I was at university back in 1997, six. Uh, I was in Ottawa, mm. uh, and uh, I won one of the case. I was uh, very proud of that. But again. Did I learn methodology? Did I learn anything technical? I don't remember the case. I don't remember anything regarding any competencies, but I yeah. remember one thing is, I remember the pressure I had to, to go under because I was under the gun for the time. I remember all that. And you know what? This teach me how to manage my, my stress, uh, help me how to manage, okay, how do I find very quickly the problem or what is the solution how do i communicate the in a very short time five minutes what is the issue what is the problem what what is my solution what am i proposing and again you know you're back to methodology you're back to that you might end up doing a SWOT analysis when you do a, a business case but you're not gonna necessarily and i hope you won't expose okay here's the strength here's the weaknesses you know you do it on a piece of paper for yourself to think but then you, it's, yeah. just, it's just a way of thinking. But don't don't go and show in a business case a sweat analysis. Honestly, it's completely useless. You know. If we have a closing tradition on this podcast, where the previous guest leaves a quote for the next one, and our former guest worked out. No, no, that's the person. And you wanted to ask. Ah, yeah, okay, it's okay, for you. And he, the quote he left for you, is the L'Oreal quote. Faire and he wanted to get That's your very good by the way I know Alain Poulier very well um, no uh, <laughs> uh, it's exactly you know, it's L'Oreal it's one of the things I like at L'Oreal um, some people might think that we're never happy because it's never over you know and it's true because at L'Oreal mm. we, we think that you can always do better and that's why I think it's it's a mm. very strong it's a very strong statement of do it, do it again, to do it better. 
and we push always our, our team to uh, to do it better than uh, is it very efficient no do you get the best out of it i think so uh and um yeah then it's you know it's part of the loyal values that i like you know we're never happy but also we never take a no for an answer i mean there's always a amazing thank you so much for coming on today thank you so much for making it to the end of this episode as a growing channel it would be so amazing if you would take one more minute of your day to reshare this episode on any platform you're liking. Hope to see you next week.